Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another video reviewing Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s terrible book, The Real Anthony Fauci. Now, previously I've reviewed each chapter one video at a time, but it's gotten to the point where I genuinely didn't expect it to be this bad, and it's gotten really, really repetitive. So for those two reasons, I don't think each chapter deserves its own video. So what I'm going to do is now lump the remaining chapters of this book into one video, and then I'll give you my closing thoughts on the book as a whole. I will then donate all of the ad revenue money that my previous video, this video, and the conclusion video will make to Doctors Without Borders because they are an organization that is directly trying to help people afflicted by HIV AIDS, which Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a full denier of. Yes, that's right. He is known as an anti-vaxxer, but not so much known as an HIV AIDS denier. But in this video, I'm going to show you just how full-blown his HIV AIDS denial really is. It is absolutely ridiculous. So let's get started so we can get this over with. Robert starts chapter five with this statement. He says, from the outset, I wanna make clear that I take no position in the relationship between HIV and AIDS, and that he was hesitant to include this chapter and blah, blah, blah. This is an outright lie because for the next 130 pages, Robert will vehemently support the idea that HIV does not cause AIDS, and even that HIV has never been isolated. It's wild. During these 130 pages, he of course mostly references Peter Duesberg, who I've talked about several times in this book review. He is, of course, a garbage human being who is directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people through his denial of HIV AIDS, and thus his denial that certain medications actually work to treat it. Make no mistake, all of the claims that Robert is talking about in these next two chapters that Peter Duesberg is also making have all been thoroughly debunked. They've been around for a while. They're old news. But Robert brings them up here because, of course, he hates Anthony Fauci. So just how bad are these ideas? Let's start with this one. Robert will claim over and over again that there is no proof that HIV causes AIDS. He thinks that it was only Robert Gallo who just said this and that everybody accepted it, and that there's no scientific study, no proof, no papers, nothing that proves that HIV causes AIDS. He is so wrong. He even goes as far as saying that Luc Montigny, one of the men who was awarded the Nobel Prize for identification and isolation of HIV as a causative agent of AIDS, doesn't think that HIV actually causes AIDS. Which is ridiculous because you can read anything written by Luc Montigny recently, and it is clear that he thinks that it absolutely is caused by HIV. For example, Robert Gallo and Luc Montigny actually wrote a piece together in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was published in 2003, and it pretty much goes over the whole story of how the scientific community came to the conclusion that HIV causes AIDS. For example, they lay out how, while AIDS can manifest in many different ways depending on the person, all of the cases are unified by the fact that a subgroup of T-cells harboring the CD4 surface antigen, this is just a protein that is on the surface of the T-cell that identifies it. There are lots of different T-cells in your body that can be differentiated this way, such as CD2, 3, 28, so on and so forth. There's lots of them. All you need to know is that CD4 cells are a particular kind that HIV likes to infect and subsequently kills. This led them to believe that the causative agent of AIDS was a virus that infected particularly CD4 T-cells. They originally thought that a virus called HTLV that also infects CD4 T-cells might be the culprit. But they go on to explain how this HTLV theory was disproven because HIV, a different virus, was repeatedly isolated from AIDS patients. And it wasn't just Gallo and Montigny who were finding this. Scientists independently were finding the same virus and naming it something different. For example, Jay Levy in San Francisco found the same HIV virus, which he called AIDS-associated retrovirus. This consistent isolation and characterization of the virus from AIDS patients, combined with the fact that the hallmark of AIDS was a low CD4 T-cell count, and HIV likes to infect CD4 T-cells and kill them in culture, led them to the clear conclusion that HIV was the cause, and this has stood up 
against scientific scrutiny for decades. I'll explain more of the evidence as Robert gets more stuff wrong. But before moving on, I'll point out that Robert really likes to highlight the fact that Robert Gallo and Luke Montigny had a bit of a nasty spat when it came to who was responsible for actually discovering HIV as the causative agent of AIDS. It's true that Robert Gallo was guilty of some scientific misconduct when it came to taking credit for the discovery of HIV as the causative agent of AIDS, but the discovery itself was genuine. Science is not always a pretty story. After all, scientists are humans too. Humans with egos, humans with flaws, and that can make things messy sometimes. This is one example where there was messy politics in science, but that doesn't undermine the fact that the science was actually good, that HIV definitely is the cause of AIDS. But of course, when Robert is getting so much of the science wrong, why not get everything else wrong in the process? For example, he moves on to talk about PCR and testing for HIV, which is a similar rhetoric to what we've been hearing with COVID recently. He says that PCR is indiscriminate and could just be amplifying tiny strands of long-dead genetic debris. Of course, he references Carrie Mullis, who was one of the original inventors of PCR, but then became a full-blown AIDS denialist and had to say that his own tools were not so good as what he claimed in his patent which is of course so incredibly wrong and something that I've talked about several times in several of my videos, and it's also something that kids learn every year by taking high school level biology labs. But in the case of HIV AIDS and Robert's claims here, one thing he says and is quite confused about is the fact that individuals with Candida or Kaposi's sarcoma and a positive PCR test have AIDS. Meanwhile, patients with a negative PCR test but also have Kaposi's sarcoma or Candida are not this is the beginning of what is a gigantic misunderstanding by Robert. Maybe it's deliberate, maybe he just doesn't know any better. But Candida is a fungal infection. Kaposi's sarcoma is a cancer caused by a virus. Both of these infections don't normally happen in healthy people with functioning immune systems. But in AIDS patients who have a crippled immune system, these infections can flourish, and then you get disease. The important part is that HIV AIDS is not the only way someone can be immune compromised and thus vulnerable to Candida infection or Kaposi sarcoma. People could have a genetic disorder that makes them more immune suppressed. They could be taking steroids that make them immune suppressed. They could have cancer and be receiving chemotherapeutics that lower the immune system. They could have just received an organ transplant and had to be on immune suppressants. There are so many reasons that an immune system can be temporarily suppressed and have it not be due to HIV AIDS. Ugh, Robert, just please learn the basics before you write a book. So because he doesn't understand these basics, he moves right into talking about why he thinks all the ways to test for HIV in AIDS patients are wrong. This starts with antibody tests, which right out the gate, he says are impossible to have calibrated because it is quote, unclear whether Gallo or any other researcher was ever able to isolate HIV, end quote. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Seriously, again, I knew he was an anti-vaxxer when I started this book. I did not know he was this dumb. Wow. HIV has absolutely been isolated. I didn't think that he needed to hear that, but here is me telling you, Robert, Yes, HIV has been isolated. Not only has it been isolated, it has been characterized genetically, biochemically, and it has been imaged in high resolution. We know its exact structure, we know its exact genome, and we know what it does in the human body. All of these papers that I'm showing on the screen right now can be accessed for free, and the links to them are in the description below. Robert, if only you read them before writing this book, you could have saved yourself a lot of embarrassment. Aside from that gigantic faceplant, Robert also says that the HIV tests didn't work. He says that because Gallo's HIV antibody test can also react to people with fever, pregnant women, and individuals who have overcome a tuberculosis infection, that therefore they don't work. This was a real problem early on with HIV antibody tests, but the problem was solved. The problem is known as sticky sera. Sticky sera is essentially a situation that happens when there are lots of other antibodies in your sample that can cross-react with your test. 
This problem has been mostly fixed with modern HIV antibody tests. Although it hasn't been 100% solved, there are multiple different ways that we can test for HIV, and normally clinicians will know to order multiple different tests that all have to agree with each other before the diagnosis is given. For example, these tests are looking for nucleic acids. This can be a PCR test or other form of nucleic acid detection. Another test is the antigen antibody test, looking for the proteins that make up the HIV virus. And the third test is HIV antibodies, which look for antibodies that your body is making against the virus in your blood. Again, these three tests are usually used in combination with each other in order to confirm a diagnosis. But like I said, Robert has complaints about all of these tests and more. None of those complaints are valid. The next one is moving to PCR. Again, he quotes Carrie Mullis, who ironically incorrectly says that quantitative PCR is an oxymoron. Yes, he is wrong about the test that he helped invent. PCR can absolutely be quantitative. In fact, we have a name for it. It's called qPCR, quantitative PCR. This is a routine test done in labs all over the world that has multiple different applications. All you need in order to make PCR quantitative is to have a system capable of recording how much nucleic acid is present at each cycle, and you have to have a standard curve. So basically what you have at the end of this test are multiple measurements over time after each cycle is complete, and a standard curve that has known amounts of nucleic acid in it. You can then plot the readings from your samples, which have an unknown amount of the target nucleic acid, and compare it to your standard curve to get an actual number. This is not complicated science. To be fair to Kerry Mollis though, this quantitative form of PCR was developed independently of him, but it was well established before he passed away. He should definitely know about it. He should definitely have told Robert about it. And Robert, if he had any inkling for good integral scientific research, then he would know about it too, but he doesn't. And lastly, we have this complaint about the antibody tests that patients can undergo in order to diagnose an HIV infection. He thinks that this doesn't make any sense because he doesn't understand immunology. He thinks that if you have antibody levels, that must mean that you're immune to the disease. No, that is not the way it works all the time. There are always exceptions in biology. In this case, HIV has evolved a mechanism to evade the immune system. Like several viruses have abilities to evade immune systems, this one does it by entering cells and integrating it into the cell's genome. That's right, the HIV virus actually modifies the genome of cells that it infects. HIV is not the only virus to do this. There are several human viruses that integrate themselves into the human genome. And in this case, once HIV is infected into its target cells, it's there. It's really hard to get rid of it after it has integrated itself into your CD4 T cells. Even the antibodies obviously can't get rid of it. This is one reason that making a vaccine to HIV has been so difficult, because it's such a tricky virus to deal with. But Robert doesn't seem to appreciate or even care about any of the complexities of the immune system and how it may interact with viruses that may or may not be able to evade it. He just says that this is something that doesn't make sense to his brain, and he just leaves it at that. He doesn't even bother to find an answer. He just uses it as ammunition in his baseless conspiracy theories. That behavior continues as he talks about CD4 T cell tests. And his lack of knowledge shows because, I kid you not, this on the screen right now is how big the section is on CD4 T cell tests in this chapter. It's barely a paragraph. Seriously, this is embarrassing. He has this tiny section where pretty much all he says is, there aren't any studies to prove this, and then cites two studies from the mid-1990s. Today, we understand really well the mechanism, the molecular cellular mechanism of how HIV infects these CD4 T cells and kills them. This is why CD4 T cell depletion is a hallmark of AIDS. It's because the virus is killing off these cells selectively, and then the patient without this 
critical part of the immune system is susceptible to all sorts of infections they would not otherwise be susceptible to. Are you blown away by how offensively stupid Robert is in these chapters? Well, it gets worse. Robert goes on to blatantly misrepresent and misunderstand Koch's postulates, which are a classic set of rules that just outline the requirements for an infectious agent to be identified as the cause of a disease. I say outline because while they are a good teaching tool in microbiology classes and they help frame the kinds of experiments that one would do in order to identify an infectious agent as the cause of a disease, they don't strictly apply in many cases of microorganisms. For example, Robert complains that HIV can be found in healthy individuals. This is, of course, because HIV takes a long time to turn into AIDS. It takes time for the virus to actually deplete your CD4 T cells and for you to see the effects of that. This is not a new concept in biology, that someone can have an infectious agent and not necessarily show disease, either right away or ever. The most famous example of this is Typhoid Mary. This is, of course, the story of Mary Mallon, a cook who famously infected several people with typhoid fever while not being sick with it herself. She was a carrier of the disease. She was able to carry it without feeling its symptoms. This is common, and it does go against Koch's postulates, because Koch's postulates are outdated. There's a lot more nuance I could talk about here, but we'll just move on to Robert's second complaint about Koch's postulates, which is that HIV has never been isolated. Again, he's going with this idea that HIV hasn't been isolated, which is just ridiculous. Who put him on to this stupid idea? Oh, it was Tom Cowan. Yeah, he actually says that Tom Cowan is the one who first suggested that HIV has never been isolated. And for those of you who might not remember, Tom Cowan is a prolific virus denier. He believes that no viruses exist, and he thinks that the heart is not a pump. I wish I was joking. Then we move on to Robert thinking that no animal has ever been infected with HIV and then developed symptoms of AIDS. This is completely wrong and completely ignores the work of famous scientists who have contributed in this field like Beatrice Hahn. Beatrice Hahn is a virologist at the University of Pennsylvania who did amazing work to determine the origins of HIV. She did this by studying the very, very similar viruses known as simian immunodeficiency viruses, or SIV, in non-human primates. Not only was her team able to identify troops of non-human primates in the wild that were infected with SIV, but they were also able to follow these troops and see that they do in fact develop AIDS. Only the ones who are infected with SIV developed AIDS. But Robert, of course, doesn't talk about any of these scientists and their work, either because he's clueless or because he wants you to believe his lies. Either way, this part of Koch's postulates have been unambiguously satisfied. Because Robert thinks that HIV has never been isolated in the first place, he's going to also think that it hasn't been re-isolated from an infected host, which it has. This is just ridiculous. But not as ridiculous as what is said next. He quotes Peter Duesberg, again, the garbage human being, who says that Human retroviruses have been a part of the human genome for as long as 3 billion years, and that they're not cell killers. He also believes that retroviruses, including HIV, are incapable of causing cancer because they are, quote, harmless passengers. These claims are just wild, especially for uh, someone who used to be a legitimate virologist like Peter Duesberg. I don't know if he's gone absolutely insane or found some reason to want to lie to everybody, but this is just a ridiculous thing to say. Retroviruses can absolutely cause disease in humans, including cancers. In fact, they're very likely to cause cancers. I mean, it just takes a few seconds of thinking about this in order to understand why retroviruses can cause things like cancer. Retroviruses are viruses that convert their RNA genome into DNA and then insert that DNA genome into your genome. When this insertion happens, it is not necessarily going to happen in a specific place in your DNA. 
it can be random. So it can insert itself into a portion of the genome that's going to mess up your own genes. If this were to happen in a stem cell and a retrovirus were to insert its genome into a part of the stem cell's genome in such a way that it messes up genes that are important for controlling, say, the cell cycle, then that could make that stem cell much more likely to become a cancer cell, and thus you would be much more likely to develop cancer. We see this in several viruses. One famous example is the Rouse sarcoma virus. This has all been very well studied, and the concept is simple. I don't know why someone like Peter Duesberg would say something so ridiculous. It's insane. But the insanity just continues, with Peter Duesberg offering his own theories as to what causes AIDS, and they're as ridiculous as you might expect. Again, these ideas are old. They have been around for a long time, and they have been systematically disproven. This first idea that Duesberg brings up and that Robert talks about is one that poppers, or a popular drug in the clubbing scene, is the real cause of AIDS. This idea has been investigated, and it turned out that the use of poppers was a poor predictor of whether or not someone actually had AIDS. And another one of Duesberg's ridiculous ideas as to what really causes AIDS is that the antiretroviral drug AZT is what causes AIDS. Yes, he thinks that the medication that was developed to treat the illness is what actually caused the illness in the first place. <sighs> of course, never mind the fact that AZT and other antiretroviral drugs have turned HIV AIDS from a death sentence to a livable disease. The last fantastic misunderstanding that I'll point out here is when Robert again talks about Kaposi's sarcoma. He points out that scientists found that not everybody who has Kaposi's sarcoma has HIV, and that the disease Kaposi's sarcoma may be caused by an as yet unidentified infectious agent transmitted mainly by sexual contact. Robert calls this a stunning development. I, I just can't with these lazy arguments that don't understand the basics. Kaposi's sarcoma was never thought to be caused by HIV itself. Kaposi's sarcoma is known to not be caused by HIV itself. It's caused by human herpes virus 8. Again, what happens here is that HIV comes in and really depletes the immune system by targeting CD4 T cells. Once this has happened, the virus that causes Kaposi's sarcoma, human herpes virus 8, is able to actually replicate uncontrolled and cause Kaposi's sarcoma. These are basics of HIV AIDS biology. This paragraph, like pretty much every other paragraph in the book, but especially this one, shows just how much Robert doesn't understand those basics, and that he's trying to make huge, sweeping, big comments on all these issues that he doesn't understand the basics of. Even after that stunning and disgusting display of ignorance, Robert has the audacity to write this. He again is trying to distance himself from the ridiculous things that he is spending over a hundred pages of his book vehemently defending. It's slimy, it's dishonest, and it describes him perfectly. But what really puts just how disgusting this all is into perspective is when he includes a quote. A quote that, for most of his readers, is probably going to be a throwaway, something they don't even really stop and think about. But I recognize this name that he's quoting from, and I know her story. But Robert doesn't tell her story. He just includes this one particular quote that she said concerning HIV AIDS tests. It's a quote from Christine Magyor. Christine was an HIV AIDS denier who very publicly and prolifically advocated against the use of AZT and other antiretroviral drugs in the treatment of HIV AIDS. Christine herself had HIV AIDS, and in 2008, she died of complications related to her illness. But what's even more disgusting is that because she denied the use of AZT as a treatment against HIV AIDS. She did not take it herself. The replication of the virus within her body was not suppressed. 
it was not suppressed when she gave birth to her daughter in 2002. And in 2005, her own daughter died of HIV AIDS related illness. The reason she believed that AZT was not a treatment for HIV AIDS are the exact same reasons that Robert is perpetuating in this god awful book. Those reasons cost lives. It cost the life of an innocent three year old girl, and it cost the life of a misguided mother. It is disgusting to perpetuate these myths. Robert doesn't care. That's why he doesn't tell Christine's story in his book. He doesn't care about the truth. He doesn't care to get the science right. And he doesn't actually care about saving lives. That's why I've decided that I'm not going to be reviewing the rest of this book chapter by chapter, because the rest of the chapters are just the same nonsense repeated over and over again, misrepresenting sources and just blatantly getting everything wrong. I mean, chapter nine is called the white man's burden in which he just goes on and on about all these crazy conspiracy theories on how Fauci and Bill Gates and the Rockefellers are all out to exploit the children of Africa for their own profits when ironically he just spent hundreds of pages advocating against the use of life-saving medicines that could save so many lives in the regions of Africa that are hit so hard by HIV AIDS. He doesn't actually care about any of these issues. He doesn't actually care about the lives of children or minorities. He only cares about perpetuating his insane conspiracy theories. I'll speculate a little bit more as to why I think he is the person that he is today in my conclusions video. But this is just to give you an idea of how stupid the rest of the book is and how undeserving it is of more of my time and more videos from me. And with all that said, that's going to bring us to the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching these book reviews. I do hope that you've enjoyed living vicariously through my terrible experience of having to read this godforsaken book. As always, all of the science that I talk about in this video is linked in the description below so that you can read it for yourself and, you know, learn something, something that won't happen if you read Robert's book. Stay tuned for my concluding thoughts video, which I'll be uploading soon. Thanks again for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to catch me next time where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.